Welcome, welcome to the Vial Hour Tory Conference Edition. Hey, you know, we're gonna have a lot of fun this session. This is Peter Gross, everyone give him a hand one more time. Hey, so if you haven't been to a Bio Hour, the way this works in the first part of the session, we're gonna have um, a Q&A, me and, me and Peter, and then there's gonna be a reflection period in the middle, and then at the end, we're gonna answer your guys' questions. So in the reflection period, feel free to text in questions, social media in questions, and we will answer them um, as we get to them, all right? Well, Peter is the executive director at Wheatstone Ministries, and that's right, give it up, okay. Wheatstone <laughs> Ministries. Is, uh, th and what they're trying to do is they're trying to invite people um, into Christian adulthood, okay? And so we're going to unpack that a little bit and unpack what that means, especially in the, with the, con in the context of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Peter is a Biola grad, a Tory Honors Institute grad. <laughs> that's right, that's right, okay? Nerds. <laughs> so we're, we're really grateful to have him here today. All right. Hey, so Peter, you know, give us a little taste of what Wheatstone is and give us a little sense of what you're trying to invite people into when you say Christian adulthood. Sure. Um, Wheatstone's a nonprofit. We are trying to reform youth ministry. Yeah. Uh, we think that the right purpose of youth ministry is Christian adulthood, that church should be the place where kids become adults, um, that youth group should be the place where kids become adults. So we do summer camps. We do staff training for that. Um, when I'm talking about Christian adulthood, there's a couple different layers to it. So on the one hand, there's the question of how do you be a Christian in the context of social adulthood, of American adulthood. It's like, yeah. here you are. Uh, you can't be a kid anymore. Um, you've grown past that. What does it mean to be an adult in American society and a Christian? Yeah. But I also uh, care very much to remind the church um, that... We're all born again. We've got to grapple on that, but that God also calls us all to grow up again, yeah. that there's something called um, spiritual maturity and Christian maturity that's distinct from Christian childishness, yeah. um, and that being born again is just the beginning. Yeah. So um, those are the two things, a vision of how to be a Christian in the context of this crazy thing, which is American adulthood, um, and what does it look like for us to fulfill uh, the command of God to grow up into the fullness of stature of Christ. Great. So it seems like you're implying that growing up into Christian adulthood is a little bit different than growing up into adulthood <laughs> as we understand right. it in the world. Can you, can you unpack that for us? Yeah, sure. Um, so we've got this weird problem in America. Um, the adulthood isn't particularly talked about, and when it is talked about, it kind of sucks. Mm. Um, uh, adulting as a, uh, uh, you know, if, if you're going to hashtag adulting, you're probably complaining about like filling out taxes or something, <laughs> or, or you're using it ironically to be like, I should be an adult, but actually, um, when I was in high school, uh, this little old lady at my church thought I was cute and she like constantly wanted to hear how high school was going. She'd be like, oh honey, how's school? <laughs> And I'd be like, great, you know, homework, I'm in the play, <laughs> still not dating. <laughs> um, and she would, she would be like, oh, you know, like as if I'm telling her like this beautiful story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and she'd be like, oh, honey, you, you make the most of it. These are the best years of your life. Yeah. And um, I, I said thank you at the time because I didn't really know how to respond. I've since then decided that the proper response to someone telling me, or you, that these are the best years of your life is to like run screaming in abject, abject terror in the opposite direction. Because if, if these are the best years of your life, that means that it all gets worse after this, that it's whoa, all downhill whoa, whoa. from here, that yeah. everything sucks. Um, uh, and there is that sort of sense. Um, you talk to a lot of American 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds, and they look back on college and high school as if it's this like, dream time or this golden era. Right, right. But that's just such a depressing way to human. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, the thing that's so spectacular about Christ's offer of everlasting life and everlasting growth is that mm. we need never stop growing up. Yeah. And that Christian adulthood could be the beginning of life to the fullness, fullest. Yeah. Um, so, so America has this sense, first off, that adulthood sucks. And, and that's depressing, it's wrong. If you're inclined to think that way, if you hear people speaking that way, just reject it. Uh, why keep going unless you believe that your 80 could be better than your 70, could be better than your 60, could be better than your 50, why? 
Mm. Um, uh, but also, it gets mixed up because we've become so fixated on these sort of conditions that we've set for how people become an adult in America, which yeah. are completely historically, uh, developmentally, um, biblically unnecessary, mm. that we've forgotten like what adulthood is, mm. both in the social sense and in the, the way that the Holy Spirit talks about in the Christian life. Um, so uh, in America, we say right now that in order to be treated like an adult, you have to turn 18 at least, you have to earn sex, you have to leave home, and you have to become financially independent. <laughs> and um, that's all bosh. Uh, <laughs> turning 18, like, I, I did not go through a sudden, did you go through a sudden metaphysical transformation Completely. on your 18th you know, right when, it, right yeah. when I turned 18, I became All of a sudden, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. The beard came in and yeah, it was Completely. perfect, yeah. perfect, great. Okay, well that settles it, we're fine then. Um, <laughs> No, it doesn't work this way. Uh, 18 does nothing. And actually, we, we've ended up with this theory because we're, we're kind of lazy. Surprise. And um, <laughs> a few decades ago, uh, you know, we, we formalized many, many of the sort of legal starting points at 18. Right. And it's ironic because the, what you should learn from that is that 18 is the deadline, not the starting point. Like, mm. they're going to start throwing you in jail if you screw up. <laughs> after 18, they're going to start, you know, suing you if you mess up after 18. You should be an adult by then. But instead, because we're like, oh, adulthood at 18, that's when it starts. Yeah. Like, no, that's the deadline. We should have gotten there by then. So, uh, 18, um, uh, in, in American society, if you don't gain sex, if you don't earn sex, then people who have look down on you. Mm -hmm. And this is even true, you know, that sounds like, you know, hookup culture or whatever, but it's even true in the church. Yeah. We've sort of unreflectively adopted this too. We know that, biblically speaking, sex and marriage go together. Yeah. So the result is that single people get treated like sub-adults mm. in the church. Rather than questioning whether sex has anything to do with adulthood, hint, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> We've adopted that and said, okay, so single people, you're going to be treated with less respect. Right. And, and this isn't anybody's fault. We just sort of fell into this by neglect rather than by, like, let's be mean to the single people. Yeah. Um, uh, but this, this has nothing to do with adulthood. Like, insert Jesus here, right? Like, Jesus fails by this, uh, by this method. Um, you have to leave home. That's completely unnecessary. It's, like, technologically recent. You have to become economically self-sufficient. Again, insert Jesus here. <laughs> Uh, so, so all of these things, we fixate on those, on those checklist right. items, yeah. when really adulthood has almost nothing to do with them. They're just the sort of hoops that America has decided everyone has to jump through for society to treat them as an adult. Completely. So as a result of thinking adulthood stinks, and then having this set of four hoops to jump through, when we run into Paul saying um, that the whole purpose of the church um, is to grow up into the fullness of the stature of Christ, into mature manhood. Right. Or when he describes the purpose statement of his ministry as, uh, for this I strive, admonishing and teaching with all with all wisdom, that I may present them mature in Christ. Like, this is what I want to do. I'm here to present people as mature. Yeah. We like, what is he talking about? Because right. he's not talking about these things and because we thought adulthood sucked. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's the distinction. Christianity... Uh, thinking about adulthood in a, in a more holistic, robust way could both transform the way we interact with our society. Yeah. Um, it could help you all feel liberated from some of the silly demands of, adult, of American adulthood and also inspired to pursue things that uh, society might not tell you you have access to yet. Um, but it also will help us to refocus on what the Holy Spirit's actually aiming to do with us when he's calling us to grow up in Christ. Yeah, yeah. tell us more about that right there. Yeah. Okay? What is the Holy Spirit asking us to grow into, and how does he push us toward that growth? Right. So um, the Holy Spirit is calling us to the fullness of the stature of Christ. Yeah. Um, have you ever spent time trying to take seriously the commands, be holy as I am holy, or grow up to the fullness of Jesus. <laughs> um, they sound like, they can, when you're not thinking carefully about this, they can sound like they're just God being mean. Yeah. Like God saying, here's an impossible standard. Do it. Go. Yeah. 
And you're like, what do you mean, go? Right. Um, but the fact is, this is the standard. Yeah. And instead of sort of entering into competition with this vision that God offers, um, entering into Christian adulthood has a lot to do with coming to realize that whenever God commands anything of us, mm-hmm. be fully like Christ, be holy. Yeah. He's not just doing it in order to torture us or make us feel inadequate. Whenever he commands anything, he's also promising it for the people who, who follow him. Mm. He completes the things that he commands in us. Yeah. Like our, our wills themselves are so broken that we can't drag ourselves into holiness. We need mm. God to complete the work in us. Yeah. So um, Christian adulthood starts with accepting as something that is suited to you and possible for you, though not in your own strength, Jesus Christ himself as your real comparison point. And laying aside anything that doesn't match up with that, and allowing the Holy Spirit to be the agent of your maturity such that you can go precisely to the places in the Christian faith that are most confusing or most painful or mm. most like distant from you yeah. and start going after them because it's not about you, it's about Christ. And right. when you do that, when you lean into the example of Jesus illuminated by the Holy Spirit and the power of the Spirit to propel us toward him, yeah. trusting that God will do what he commands yeah. in us, um, then uh, you will see meaningful growth, a growth that could last past death. Yeah. Um, so this is the hope. This is, hopefully we'll get into this more in the questions, but that, that's a little bit of what I want to I wanna be No, I love to. that. I love that the idea of the commands, they're actually a promise. Right. The promise to, that, that the Spirit is bringing us toward fullness. Right. We can't save ourselves. We also can't sanctify ourselves. Completely. Um, and God knows that when he commands things of us. Yeah. But we need to abide with him. We need to stay with him. Yeah. Um, that's the only way. Yeah, well, you know, you know, this vision of the Christian adult, that mm-hmm. seems awesome. Right? Yeah. How come we stay in this adolescent stage? Why do we just want to stay there so much? Yeah. I do. Yeah. I want to go back to 18. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember 18? Not very well. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. How many here are 18? How many of you think that the 30-year-olds should want to get back to this? <laughs> yeah, nobody. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, uh, part, of, part of this is... Um, you know, this is, this is a little silly, but part of this is actually corporate manipulation. Like, Ameri- the American r- economy runs on having good consumers, yeah. and it has been statistically determined that the most gullible humans are uh, males age 16 to 25. So <laughs> there's this, like, corp- corporate incentive to get us all to sort of try to be as stupid as male college students. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, don't shoot the messenger. This is like corporate research. You all are the most gullible. Um, and, and, and so if you can get the 50-year-old mm-hmm. to, to wish that they could live like the 24-year-old, right. like the 16-year-old, right. then you've won a sort of consumer slave for, for years, and they have more money at that point, so you right. can drag even more out of them. So th- there's this... Um, there's this uh, uh, there's a corporate incentive to keep us all as stupid as possible. Um, uh, because, because the most mature people that you know are probably the ones who are least persuaded that uh, buying stuff helps. They're the people who are most capable of enduring through the loss of any material or relational um, or intellectual benefits that they had before. They can keep standing straight. Yeah. Um, they don't they don't need what this world has to offer. They are mature. Yeah. Um, uh, so um, I think that, that there is that corporate pressure to stay stupid. Um, but also, um, the, the world is uncertain and painful and Completely. Uh, confusing. Completely, yeah. And, um, Technology allows us, if we want to, yeah. to prefer to live in a fantasy world yeah. that we can sort of control, that we can avoid as much pain as possible. Yeah. Um, God, is not, God is not 
a fantasy god. He's, he's the god of this world. He's the god of natural disasters world and injustices world. Mm. Um, he's here. Yeah. And um, we can be so scared off that we end up wanting to leave, mm. um, wanting to be uh, managed in the way a child is managed. Mm. Um, so, and that hasn't been possible in the past. It's much more possible now, mostly for techn technological reasons. Um, but again, uh, to return, we mostly talk about adulthood as if it's worse than childhood, Completely. as if it's worse than youth. But like, uh, when my grandma was dying, the, the words, I love you from my grandpa to her on her deathbed, yeah. it's impossible for me at this age and at this level of a relationship to be able to say any words as weighty as that. Mm. He's accrued so much meaning and pain and joy and sort of associations in the world. He's shown what love means in so many ways that the exact same words can be 10,000 times deeper than I'm even possibly capable of. Yeah. Um, children, children can be injured and abused. They can get hurt, they can be in pain, yeah. but adults can start transforming that into meaningful lament and grief, like the kind that fills the scriptures and redeems the pain and turns mm. it into something beautiful without destroying or pretending like the pain didn't happen. That's good. Um, kids can sort of fall in love with each other, they can get Twitter pated. Um, <laughs> adults can build romances. Like, adults can, I, again, 70-year-olds flirting, it's like a whole nother level, right? <laughs> like, if, they're, if they've remembered to keep doing it, they're just better than us. Um, there is so much hope and so much joy ahead if you will endure yeah. toward and through the cross by the power of the Holy Spirit, if you will stand up. Um, so many of us were massively injured by... Uh, people with adult power in adult bodies and childish minds and souls. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, probably a good number of you had your childhoods effectively stolen from you by people who were like this. And the bad news is that once childhood is gone, it cannot be replaced. Mm. It is actually impossible. This is why it is so evil to hurt a kid. Once, once childhood is gone, yeah. an adult mind... Heart, spirit, body is incapable of reliving the sort of wild-eyed gorgeousness of being a kid. You can't. Right. And if you try to, you kill both the childishness and the adulthood. Mm. So when, when a childhood is taken away by a childish adult, the person is actually deprived of something that can't be replaced. Mm. And, um, but so many of us have had childhoods removed by childish adults, or we've had childish adults paraded into celebrity or political positions that, um, that we aspire to. Um, so many of us have had this happen that we can forget that adulthood is what childhood is for. Mm. That the only way to meaningfully honor a childhood, whatever degree you had one, the only way to meaningfully honor it is to transform it into a maturity that can create beauties and realities in the world that will inspire every child that comes after you. So, um, yeah, that's a sort of meandering answer to your question, but um, we, we, we get stuck because we're scared. We get yeah. stuck because we want to stay safe. We want to stay in the back of the minivan with mom and dad driving us home. Instead of entering the world, like trying things and being willing to fail at them, entering the world and um, asking questions, even though we know that there isn't anyone who can give us an easy answer, entering the world and facing pain and finding a way through it and trying to beautify it with lament, um, having this sort of liberty and authority and sense of your own identity in the world, these things are beautiful and they are incomparably better to childhood. And they're worth the cost of the pain that it takes to move from one to the other. All right. You can't say I love you to someone in the way that my grandpa did unless you have endured through the 50 years of marriage. Yeah. Um, you can't unlock the beauties of the Christian life without enduring by the power of the Spirit through the cross to resurrection. This is real stuff. Um, 
The world doesn't allow us or shouldn't allow us to close our eyes and our ears and our mouth and pretend that things aren't as hard as they are. Um, and the Holy Spirit certainly doesn't. Mm. Wow, Peter. You know, you said a lot there. Okay. <laughs> We're going to let that soak in a little bit. Okay. We're going to invite Ben. Okay. He's the events guy in the back. He's going to play a song for us so that it'll soak in a little bit more. Okay. And we're going to invite you guys to ask us questions, text in questions, social media in questions, and then we will come back to them right after the song. Okay. All right, Peter. Hey, we've got some questions. Here's our first question. All right. What does the process of partnering with the Holy Spirit to mature socially and spiritually look like? How do we do it? Right. So um, the, the starting place is to recognize whose job is whose. Yeah. Um, you are incapable of becoming what God promises to make you. Mm. Um, however, God is um, interested in your freedom, and he wants you to participate in the thing that he's doing. Um, God is so generous um, with his offering of intimacy that he even offers us the intimacy of participation in our own sanctification. Mm. Now, the fact that he asks us to participate in our own maturity doesn't mean that it's up to us. Um, uh, my, my dad uh, asked me to make a tree fort with him when I was a kid, not because I'm good at tree forts. <laughs> and I like seriously messed it up. I attached one of the support beams in the wrong place. But he's good enough that he like changed the design of the tree fort yeah. uh, on the fly, improvisationally. We had a different looking tree fort than we expected, and it was awesome. Mm. Um, he turned my mistake into a feature. Mm. Um, this, this work of the Holy Spirit is Holy Spirit-led. So the first and most important thing is to um, ascribe to him primary agency, mm -hmm. accept whatever goals he offers as actually possible for you. Mm. So don't, don't just treat it like Christianese when God says, be holy. He's going to make you holy whether you like it or not. You might as well like it. <laughs> You might as well join in. Um, Paul is constantly reminding the churches in his letters, uh, th this one's from Colossians, for you, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. And then he goes on to be like, so act like it, you idiots. Um, not because you can suddenly poop, you know, like, ta-da, you are beatified. Um, saint version of yourself right there. Uh, you can't. You're still waiting for the resurrection. Um, but if you accept that this goal is real for you mm. and that you can and you will make progress and that you have an opportunity to join in and that it's the Holy Spirit's work first, these are the most important things to start. But then you have to be someone who's ready to follow instructions, which means like hearing the instructions and obeying. Um, you need to be someone who is seeking out the Holy Spirit's will for your life, that seeking out this vision of the next step that you can take. And God is, um, yeah, God is 100% faithful, right? And 100% unpredictable, I think, in the Bible. Like, time after time, he promises to his people, I'm going to do this for you. Right. And then they're like, okay, so since you're going to do that, it's going to go this way. And then he does it completely differently. Like, every single stinking time. <laughs> um, God is completely faithful. He will do this for you, and he's completely unpredictable. You don't know how he's going to do this for you. So you need to be someone who is committed to following the Holy Spirit, trusting of the Holy Spirit, accepting of uh, the real goals for your life, and then ready to obey whatever, whatever he does. Um... um I think, yeah, let's, let's leave it there. Let's get to some more questions. I think yeah. the next thing I was going to say will come out. Okay, great. Well, Peter, okay, what about becoming like a child? Shouldn't we avoid growing up in order to live in the kingdom that Jesus describes? Yeah, uh, this one's fun. Um, <laughs> uh, Jesus calls us to be like children. Um, John calls us little children uh, over and over again. There's, there's a nice thing about the word like. Um, 
in order to be like something, you have to be different from it. Like, if you're a panda, you can't be like a panda, you're a panda. <laughs> um, the command to be like a child implies that you freaking aren't one. <laughs> um, There are a few different ways. So if you look in scripture, the kind of mistake that people are making in the Bible about childhood and adulthood is mostly to treat childhood as this like horrible, stupid thing. Like get those kids away from Jesus, right? They're not worth it. So that I think in a lot of, uh, in Jesus's contemporary time, the, the main problem that he was facing was that they thought adulthood was too awesome. Yeah. And that childhood was too dumb. Yeah, the exact opposite of what we're facing now. And, and you can enter into a an adulthood that's so forgetful of childhood and so dismissive of the inheritance that you received from the adults who came before you um, that you miss out on a great deal of the joys. The best, the best adulthoods are the ones that spring out of childlikeness. Mm. And here's the other thing about this. Uh, Paul, uh, Peter... The author of Hebrews, um, if you were tracking childishness, childlikeness, and adulthood in them, they would all be like, grow up, grow up, grow up, grow up, grow up. Stop. I mean, you should be done with the milk, eat solid food. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, it is my goal to present you mature in Christ. So Paul, Peter, author of Hebrews, it's very consistent in this respect. They are almost always focused on the life that came before and the place that you are when you're converted, little baby Christian you. And compared to that, they call us to grow up. Um, you should never be content with where you are in the faith because you aren't Jesus yet. Mm. Um, unless you are, in which case, may I follow you. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, but John, pretty universally, has his sights fixed on the glory that's yet to be revealed. Um, John sees this vision of um, union with God past death. Mm. Um, and compared to what we will be, um, w the most mature that you could be before death will be like simple childishness. Um, heaven, isn't, heaven isn't a, a static thing, however it happens to work. It's not, it, you don't like s freeze. <laughs> freeze frame right there. <laughs> Um, we get to enter further and further and further and further into union with God yeah. for everlasting life. Yeah. Um, we get to discover the joys of intimacy with the church for everlasting life. And uh, so compared to what you will be, which is the fullness of uh, Jesus, you will be like Jesus. You will be holy. You will be prayerful without ceasing. You will. Otherwise, God is faithless to his word. Um, compared to that, um, we're silly little things. Great. So, well, Peter, you know, I, I want to ask this question, okay? Great. And it's, it, I think it's a good question. What are the first concrete steps you would recommend then to those who desire that kind of spiritual maturity that you're describing? Right. Um, uh, the first steps are to take stock of um, your ignorances, your fears, um, your confusions. Um, that, that's step one. God is not intimidated by anything. Uh, God is not, um, uh, does not allow any pain that makes sanctification impossible. God, mm. God is not overwhelmed by things that are confusing. He wants to draw us into a place where we can stand confidently beside him mm. without any fear or shame or concern, no matter what happens to us. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, this is one of the best passages for comparing childish Christianity to mature Christianity. Um, he describes childish people as being tossed to and fro by the winds of doctrine, mm. um, uh, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. They're gullible. Mm -hmm. um, they haven't been planted firmly and securely. Mm -hmm. So in order to become someone who can be secure anywhere, you need to start going to the places that test that security, 
trusting that God's adequacy is sufficient for you. Mm. Um, so, um, uh, I, the command to seek the Lord in Scripture, uh, you know, we've, we've got this term seeker sensitivity. We're talking about unbelievers trying to figure things out. In the Bible, when it commands people to seek, it's basically always commanding the people of God to seek. And you don't seek for something that you have. As soon as you're comfortable with your Christianity, you are likely submitting yourself to an idol, to a, a, a the, theology God rather than a living God yeah. who exceeds you. Yeah. So the first concrete step is to gather like treasure maps your hardest, most confusing questions or the ways in which the Christian faith seems disconnected from reality. Mm. To, to gather the, the places that scare you most about Christianity, see them clearly, and offer them to God. Mm. And, and um, strive after the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God in the context of those things. You can't seek for what you already have, so you need to be familiar with you, what you don't get yet. Those aren't threats to you anymore. If you are in Christ, um, there, is, there isn't any more pain possible for any individual to experience that Christ hasn't already endured. Mm. Christ has already endured the maximum amount of pain that any human could endure. You can't experience any pain that doesn't have his companionship if you are united to him by his spirit. Um, you cannot go into any place that is too confusing for Jesus, but if he acts towards you like he acted toward the people of Israel when he was on earth, he might not give you an easy, quick answer. Mm. Um, I'm going to refrain from that sermon, which is a whole other sermon. Goodbye. <laughs> um, so, first concrete steps. Know what you don't know and, and see what you're afraid of. Offer them to God systematically, carefully, and start going there. If Christ is faithful and if he is who he says he is, you can in the spirit. Now, if you go there in your own strength, it will bulldoze you, right? Yeah. So this is, this is a great test to see whether you're being led by the spirit because it will not bulldoze the spirit. If you go and you get bulldozed, you know, wipe yourself off, come back and be like, wow, I was really bad at that, wasn't I? And pick yourself up and try again. Um, the kids need you to, the kids coming behind you need you to. Um, we need to be, uh, we need to become spiritual fathers and brothers and sisters and mothers to the people who are coming up next. Um, and to do that, we need to be ready to face the confusion. So that's, that's the concrete thing. Know what you lack and go there yeah. by the power of God. Great, great. Peter, here's another question, okay? How do you respectfully communicate <laughs> that you are now an adult to your parents? <laughs> I know who asked that, by the way. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they all ask it. <laughs> <laughs> um... Um, <laughs> There's so many layers to this question. There are so many <laughs> layers to this question. Um, respect is almost always respect for a person's freedom, right? When you're asking people to respect you, they're, you're asking them to treat you as someone who's free, mm. not to like put you in a box that they can control. Um, so the most important thing is to preserve your parents' ability to disagree with you. Mm. Um, and they might disagree with you forever. Um, and that is their, that's their prerogative. Mm. Um, you can't force anyone to recognize you as <laughs> a whole human. Um, you can't force anyone to do this. If you did, you would be behaving childishly. Mm. Um, the best you can do is um, suggest to them <laughs> mm. that you are an adult, ideally in a way that they will hear, which in my experience is not usually through like, 
guess what? I'm adult now. <laughs> Surprise. Uh, <laughs> Surprise. And they're like, uh, um, figure out what language they will understand in respect to adulthood and try speaking that language to them. Um, but the, the main thing is, like, it is way better to be an adult and not recognized mm. than it is to be treated as an adult and not actually be one. Um, childish people with adult power are more dangerous than anything on earth. Mm. Um, and one of the best environments to learn how to distinguish being an adult from just receiving the authority or being treated like an adult is to actually be in places where you aren't being treated as one. Um, because then you can start to distinguish, am I just doing this for the approval or am I actually aspiring to become like Jesus? Mm. Um, if you are aspiring to become like Jesus, then it won't matter what your parents say. Um, now, you still need to love them, you still need to communicate with them. Um, but again, since respectfully was the key word, you need to do it in a way that preserves their freedom to disagree with you, yeah. um, just like you would want them to do. Yeah. You know, Peter, I wonder even with that question, it's like, oh, whoa, what was the question? Uh, uh, Communicating respectfully with so, parents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so even with that question, I wonder if it's kind of like, um, I have to in some sense, be the adult, even in that relationship right. sometimes. You know? yeah. And like, I have to uh, live into adulthood even mm -hmm. if my parents can't see that. Right. And then I might have to adult my parents in some mm -hmm. sense. That's kind yeah, of Yeah, you can be, just like, Chris, uh, just like childhood can really be taken away from people and it can never be returned. Right. Um, the respect of adulthood can be taken away from people. Like, um, I've never met a single person in the church who, who hasn't said to me that they are treated with the same respect as married people in the church. Mm. Even like some of the professors here at Biola, um, people who are obviously more mature than most adults. <laughs> um, uh, so th this, isn't, this isn't a unique problem to college age students. Um, and in fact, this is just like a watered down problem compared to um, the abuse of sexism or racism or um, classism or something and something else like this where people treat you as a subhuman or something less than you actually are based on stage of life or history or the way you look or whatever yeah um, um, this is like uh, small fries compared to that um, model yourself after Jesus who endured much greater abuse uh, much greater social injustice in this respect than you did how how would Jesus be in respect to them great all right, Peter. Here's another question. Okay, how do we encourage our peers in healthy Christian adulting? <laughs> With the hashtag. Yeah, ha healthy. And the quote. Hashtag Christian adulting. Um, very thorough. <laughs> um, help each other believe that it's beautiful. That's good. Um, help each other believe that it's beautiful. The, the, the main impediment, I think, to entering into adulthood is just this horrible marketing campaign that's been waged to make it seem dumb. Mm. Um, there, is no, there is no exploration like an adult's exploring. There is no romance like an adult's romance. There is no grief like an adult's grief. There is no joy like an adult's joy. There is no intellectual pursuit like an adult's intellectual pursuit. Everything gets better and will into everlasting life. Mm. Find whatever it takes to remind you that this is beautiful. Like, well, I, I love recommending to college students and high school students that they should adopt as one of their ministry priorities to volunteer in convalescent homes. Mm. Because when someone is getting close to dying, it's really difficult to disguise um, a life lived toward life paths to death, right. or a life that's conquered by death. Mm. Um, so you'll see what it means to die well and die poorly. Plus, these people need you. They need, they need love. Their, America treats our elders terribly. Um, um, so this, this is, remind yourself of the beautiful people who are on the verge of death, people that you want to be like, people that you trust will be even better than they are at death right afterward by the power of the Spirit because they've placed themselves in Christ. Um, I, I really love watching um, sad, 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 sad movies because um, 
four sides. Yeah, I actually, I, I like, uh, never mind. Um, uh, really sad movies, ones that aren't just manipulative, like Hallmark Channel sad, kind of manipulative. <laughs> but like, um, when, you're, when you're really looking at a story that's beautifully sad, it brings what's real to the fore and it helps the stupid, ridiculous, vain things sort of filter away. Um, so I don't know, watch movies like Make Way for Tomorrow together. Um, watch movies like The Tree of Life together. Mm. Uh, um, find stories and examples in your community of people who have grown up and then model yourselves after them. Keep it beautiful um, and resist the depressing lie that you are at the peak of your life. Mm. Um, you're at the beginning. Hopefully, 10 years from now, you'll look back on this time at Biola and be like, wow, that sucked by comparison. <laughs> All right, Peter. Hey, you know, as a way to close, we always ask our guests, what are some of the biblical principles that help shape your ideas for today? Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I got pretty dissatisfied with a sort of stubborn behavioral Christianity mm. um, that I was holding on to for my own preservation um, when I came to Biola. Um, the conversations that I had here helped liberate me from it. Um, there's a kind of Christianity that's just like, am I doing it right? Am I doing it right? Am I doing it right? Um, yeah. Uh, I need to check these boxes off. Man, I really stink at them. Horrible me. Uh, uh, um, ah, this is an idea that's scary to me. Uh, I can't listen to it because, you know, I'll go to hell or something. <laughs> um, I knew that that had to be wrong. Uh, that that couldn't, that didn't match what Jesus was describing. And likewise, in my prayer life, I had this, like, um, sense that like, how do you pray to omniscient, omnipotent being? How do, you, how do you ask him for stuff when he already knows what's going to happen? And I thought of it as this tiny little shriveled thing. So it was in the search for um, a Christianity that exceeded me, yeah. that was bigger than me, that was bigger than the whole cosmos, um, that I started running into these... Um, exasperations of Jesus with his disciples, like, how long will I be with you? Mm. Um, or his interest in keeping them confused until they came to a conclusion on their own. And Paul saying, grow up, grow up, grow up. And, and in my sort of despair about my stubborn Christianity, I started latching onto those. Mm. Because um, they can seem scary, but they're the only place that I know where there's hope for a kind of life that isn't dependent on me, um, and that could uh, never stop um, growing in joy and peace. So um, it's probably it's based mostly on staring at the life of Jesus, thinking about what heaven means, and then listening to Paul especially talk about what it means to grow up. Um, again, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, if I had to pick one place, is the place to start diving in really deep on this. Um, uh, but yeah, that's, that's the story for me. Awesome, awesome. Let's thank Peter for sharing his wisdom with us today. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.